Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming in the morning on a Saturday. Um, my name is Christian Stark. I'm a technical product manager at Red Hat. I'm responsible for advanced cluster management for Kubernetes. Here I'm responsible for the observability part, for the application lifecycle management part, and also for quite a long time for the governance part. Um, today, I want to speak to you about environment as a service. As you see in the right grayed out, this talk um, has been discussed with Rafael Spazzoli. Maybe some of you know him. He's really one of uh, the lead architects at Reddit with lots of uh, work in, in different areas around OpenShift. And basically, the idea of this talk is based on his blog series, Environment as a Service. You will see it at the end um, in the links um, before, before parts of the blog. So let's take a look into the agenda. We will talk about our namespace as a service, cluster as a service. We will talk about multi-tenancy, about secrets management, and as some conclusion about environment as a service. And uh, at the last point, um, I really hope to also get some feedback from you regarding how Backstage can support the process here. Because this is really something, and this is also the good thing about this talk. So we have already quite a lot of things to offer. Many, many solutions are working. But it's also really a topic which is influencing our work, where we are trying to find better solutions. And yeah, we are really looking at the moment if environment as a service with cluster management, with namespace management, can be uh, implemented very well in, in Backstage or not. So let's start uh, with namespace as a service. So first of all, let's uh, quickly discuss some uh, design principles. So we will um, store all the configurations in Git. I was recently asking around about um, how many customers are using Git at the moment, and the answer is close to 100%. Huh? But, uh, but certainly not for all components. So for example, for provisioning clusters with Git, it's for sure not so much. Or for provisioning OpenShift virtualization, which is a hot topic, it's certainly not so much. So in this talk, we will um, also use workflows. So we need human interaction workflows, or not human interaction, we will discuss later. Um, for basically implement approval uh, processes which are integrated in the Git platform. And once a configuration is um, approved in this approval process, it certainly needs to be uh, applied directly to infrastructure. The other thing is that we are using the Git Observator, so Argo CD, in order to talk with Git and to apply the configurations. And we will also need a tool for cluster management. And in this talk, we will use open cluster management, and we will use Hive for provisioning the clusters. So let's start uh, very easy about, about our namespace. So what are interesting properties for a namespace? So first of all, we have the team developer, deployer owner label. No, we, we want to know who is in, responsible for this namespace. To which group does this namespace uh, belong? I can tell you that I had escalations, uh, for example, last year, where a customer did not know about who is responsible for this namespace. He thought it can be deleted, but it was a critical one. So um, we need the application. So we want to know which part, which application should be deployed in this name. So this is also very important for resolving the dependencies. Hmm? We need to know the environment. So this is classical. It's a dev, GUI, prod environment, for example. We need to know the region. So we want to have a region as close as possible um, to us. And we certainly would like to, to, um, to know the size of the namespace. And this is really something which is uh, also affecting a lot um, our work at the moment. So certainly, we would like to, kn to, to know that customers are using namespaces configured correctly for their applications. This means the namespaces should not uh, request too much uh, resources. Hmm? So this is something we are working with our customers. Either we are using vertical port autoscaler, or we are also working on something like right sizing for properly determine, to time, to determine the resources for the namespace. Now, let's uh, take a look into this namespace provisioning process. So you have basically a developer or a deployment team which is filling some form. And you see here that a PR is getting created. It is uh, um, approved by the platform team persona. And then Argo CD will basically apply these changes from Git. And here you see now a very interesting um, thing. So 
we have here some namespace configuration. So the namespace is created and we have a namespace configuration operator who is basically watching some labels, some annotations, some, some properties from the namespace and is making the configuration based on the labels which she is finding. Once uh, this configuration has been done, we will also uh, invoke some external system. Um, in this case, we will use, uh, for example, LDAP. And this LDAP will sync the groups which are defined there into the system. And the group sync operator will ensure that the user and the roles, what we have defined, are mapped to the group correctly. So this is an example um, set up. And just a question uh, into the audience. So is somebody aware of you about the namespace configuration operator or about the group sync operator? Have you heard this? So these are uh, operators which are really uh, used a lot by, by our customer, um, especially the group sync operator. And yeah, so the, the, the most uh, interesting question here is basically, is this something you will get official support or not? Hmm? But as you don't use it yet, maybe it's something also interesting for you. So what you see here is basically another way how um, to configure the namespace. So this is, uh, this, what you see here can achieve the same as the namespace configuration operator. Basically, you are configuring a namespace, you are starting it, and you see here that we are looking in the range uh, line about the label deployer customize global. So if the namespace has this label, we will apply a secret into this namespace. And what you see here also with the hub from secret, we have the option to either say, this secret is coming from a namespace on the cluster, or it is coming from a central cluster. Now, so you have the possibility to have a secret on a central cluster and copy it to every place you like into, into your cluster, no? based on the namespace which has been created. So that the namespace is containing the secret and the developer could already start using um, this secret. No? The same way, by the way, you could uh, use this method, what you are seeing here, also for updating resources or for deleting resources. So you see that it's also a good way to create here resource quotas, to create limit ranges, to create network policies. And one thing um, what the customers are really asking a lot here is basically when you are configuring a namespace uh, this way, um, can you afford that it's done immediately, or that, it's, that it lasts a few seconds, or does it need to be done immediately? So for example, if you create a namespace and you want to start a pod immediately after creating this namespace, then it must be um, configured correctly. Else the pod, for example, would be started on a different cluster or on a different node. Hmm? So this is something, and what you see here is basically implemented by open cluster management policies. But if you need it immediately, then you need something like an admission controller, for example, gatekeeper or Caverno. Here we see some tips uh, what can help you in order to implement this namespace uh, configuration provisioning process with Git. So first of all, you need to have some dependencies. No? So let's assume, let me go back quickly. Let's assume you want to create here a namespace or, and you want to ensure that everything is configured before you are going into the next step, before you are syncing the groups. So, Often this dependency is required, so you can achieve this with sync waves in Argo CD, or with policies you can specify a dependencies field. No? We need before each, so we need to loop over objects. You have already seen this example where you are looping over a namespace. I will show an example also in the next slide. You will have some patching. So uh, patching resources is very hard with Git, and this is why Raphael has uh, written the patch operator. Not sure if you have ever heard this, but with Argo CD and now with server-side apply, it is possible to patch resources, quite good in my opinion, maybe for 90% of the use cases, but 10% which are really complex. So for example, you want to patch the all of, of an open shift cluster with different indexes uh, of the providers, then the patch operator um, is, is something necessary. We want to, we need to move secrets between different namespaces and uh, maybe even clusters. You have seen the example before. Yesterday I was reading that the reflector is one of the top 10 things somebody should need in a Kubernetes cluster so that he can copy this secret. 
The same can be done with the policy templates that I have shown before. Another a very important topic, or which is coming often, is how can you achieve that once a secret is getting updated, that you can automatically trigger a change in a restart of a, of a pod no, to update in deployment. This is something where you have the reloader operator, and it can be done also with, with Caverno. And the last thing, sometimes it's necessary to have some imperative automation. For example, we are still using this for ETCD backup, where you just have uh, OpenShift commands or Kubernetes commands for doing this backup in some job. Hmm? Here, I show you also this example, what I have mentioned before. Here, we are looping over uh, the user. And we are checking, for example, if the user um, is part of a certain group. In this case, if the user is part of team one, team A, sorry. And if, if, if it is the case, when we are creating, for example, here in other namespace, with all the labels and with all the data set dynamically, no? based on the loop. And here, what you see here is basically an example um, from Caverno. This is what I've mentioned before. When a secret which is called block secret has been updated, I will update uh, the deployment by updating an annotation, which is triggering a redeployment. So these are quite important patterns um, while provisioning. So um, now we will talk a little bit about cluster as a service. And um, yeah, many customers uh, are certainly still provisioning uh, clusters with Ansible. And um, we are doing this with Ansible directly. We have also customers who are using the API from Open Cluster Management in order to provision clusters. We have also um, native Ansible collections, but as mentioned at the beginning, we want to stay declaratively. No? Um, Red Hat has also um, provided a cluster as a service operator. There was a talk last year here, and I don't mention it a lot, but it's something which certainly also could be used for this scenario. What you see here is the UI um, of ASM, and here on the right is basically how to create clusters in a GitOps style. So basically, you have certain uh, objects which are provided. So you have a cluster deployment as the main object to create clusters or to remove clusters if you delete it. And we are also working together with the assisted installer, which makes it a little bit easier to, to provision clusters in an API fashion. Um, what is important to mention is that um, we have now techniques, which you might know, like hypershift and single load open shift, which makes it much easier, much cheaper um, to create clusters. And this is why I think it's, it's more easy and it makes much more sense in, than in the past to say that if you want to provision an environment, then you should also maybe create at least one cluster. I come to this a little bit more, why it could be also be more than one cluster. No? And again, there are several use cases where admission controllers can support. I mentioned already Calvarno and Gatekeeper in admission controller. And here, I want to show you an example. So if you want to have cluster as a service, then you need rules. No? So you can either achieve these rules with RBAC. But this is, this is very complex to achieve with RBAC. So what customers are doing is exactly what you see here. So you want to, for example, ensure that a new cluster it has some naming conventions. No? Or you will check the amount of clusters which have already been created. The use case which is even more interesting for some of our customers is we have customers who deleted clusters in production and they did not think that it has so many consequences. You can certainly also say, I don't allow to delete the cluster with an admission controller who is blocking this no? unless, for example, I have some super user who is part of this role. No? So this is really something which comes quite often. Uh, what you see here is basically a short summary about namespace and cluster as a service. So this is also reflecting the reality. Our customers have still larger clusters where we don't want to have one cluster for a team. No? So these are shared clusters no? where we are sharing the namespaces with all the implications like RBAC multi-tenancy. So for from an open cluster management point of view or ACM point of view, it does not really matter. No? So basically, either you use it um, as cluster as a service, you create it with Argo CD, as we have shown in the previous slide, or you're using Argo CD to create a new namespace. Now, if you create a new namespace, then what is 
interesting. And remember at the beginning where we talked also about the environment, we would need to determine which cluster should be selected in order to create this namespace. Hmm? So let's talk about multi-tenancy. And I know that this is a quite uh, complex slide. It was uh, done while, while, while we have been on a customer visit. So basically, how can multi-tenancy look like in a multi-cluster environment? And what you see here on the right is basically the concept of cluster set. So you have basically a team, team one, team two, which is owning a set of clusters, a number of, of clusters. And this has basically a cluster set administrator, cluster set viewer, so you are defining RBAC on this cluster set level. On the, on the left, or on the, on the middle here, you have namespaces. So basically, you want to assign a namespace, and if you deploy something into this namespace, then it can only be deployed into the cluster set. No? So for example, I have here a team two, and I have here, you see the object manage cluster set binding, which will ensure that you can only deploy to clusters or a subset of clusters into this cluster set team two. No? So this is, this is the first thing. Now, what the customers uh, then are doing is, they are creating, for example, application sets. No? So you know Argo CD application sets, and here we are combining application sets with another very important object, which I will show a little bit more, which is the placement object. The placement object is in charge for determining on which cluster you would like to deploy. So for example, you would, as a developer, say, I have my own development cluster and I have my own staging cluster. This means you, can, you have two clusters in your developer cluster set, and then you can even switch depending on what you would like to deploy now. So regarding developer onboarding in OCM, so what should a developer be able to do? And certainly, there are different opinions. So a developer, he should work in his own pre-configured namespace. Um, he might be even able, able to create his own clusters, as we have shown before. So in your developer cluster set, you can create your own clusters with certainly some restrictions, supervised by governance, for sure. Um, he can deploy, but certainly he cannot deploy into other cluster sets. No? So the other managed cluster sets, like Team 2, he should not even see. No? And as I mentioned, he should be able to edit the placement uh, in his cluster set so that he can switch between different clusters if he wants to. And this is basically how it looked like. So you have here your cluster set. You see here that you have your developer environment and a cluster A, cluster B. And here, you would have the option, for example, to say, I have here a placement object. And basically, what you can do in placement is to update the selector. No? So you can, for example, say, only if this cluster is my dev cluster, no? then, this, then the deployment will happen there. No? So, and what I really want to highlight that RBAC is, is not easy uh, when you want to uh, implement such a developer on, onboarding. Hmm? So let's um, come now um, to the other topic, which is uh, secrets management. And um, yeah, you see here basically some basic architecture about secrets management. And as I have mentioned at the beginning, this is really a topic where lots of work has still to be done. So I showed you at the beginning that we have a policy which can copy the secrets from the hub cluster to the managed clusters. And to be honest, this is already a very good solution. Um, we have a team at Reddit which is called Validated Patterns, which has a multi-cloud GitOps solution where exactly this is being used together with the external secrets operator. This means you are setting up vault, you are getting the secret from the external secrets operator, and you are distributing it in a secure way to the different namespaces and clusters. Now, what you see here is basically more the process of setting up vault. And we are also using here a configurator, which is called the vault config operator, also maintained by Raphael. And um, it's a really complex operator. And what you really um, maybe you should know is that uh, Vault is, is a very huge API. And um, it's imperative by design. No? And what the operator is doing is basically he's provi is providing the API in a declarative way. And as far as I know, about 30% of the, of the API has been implemented by the operator. No? So, it works in a way that you have uh, at least a two or three step process. So the first step is that you need to install Vault. No? You need to install Vault and 
the secret administrator, he needs to set up the structure of Vault. Then you need to install the Vault config operator, but by default, and this is a strong security uh, measure, by default the Vault config operator does not have any permissions. Right? So it needs to be uh, assigned by some root policies which need to be set. And once this has been set up, um, you can basically, the Vault, the, the Vault config operator has the permissions to set up all the rules he needs um, for creating secrets. Hmm? So in a second step, after everything has been set up, uh, then a developer could also even have the option, and this is something which yeah, depends from team to team, from organization to organization, to set his own secrets. And this is basically what you see here in one of the examples. So you might have a policy, again, assigned for every namespace in the same way that we, as we have discussed at the beginning. And you can, for example, say, in my vault, I'm defining here um, a secret in my path, which has as one part of the name, the namespace where I'm currently in. Uh, so this is a very, every namespace basically has its own secrets for reading, so that every developer automatically knows which secret he has to use. And what you also could do is, yeah, this, is this is what you see here in the second uh, example, that you can also create your own secret. So developers should be able to also configure their own secrets which they need using Vault in a declarative way. Hmm? Now, if this has been set up, then Raphael suggests in a second, second flow that you can basically um, do an, a commit and basically update your deployments um, requesting the secrets which you have set um, at the, in the first step. And what is really, the, what we are getting asked a lot here is basically around um, what should be used. So many, many, many customers are using external secrets operator. Um, but we have also the other option to say, if you are using only HashiCorp Vault, and maybe you have heard a little bit about this acquisition of uh, IBM, that you can directly uh, get these secrets from, from Vault. Hmm? Or what we are also uh, recommending for some use cases is to use a CSI driver, because um, we have customers, not many, but we have, who don't like to have secrets at all in the environment. And with the CSI driver, you would directly mount the vault as a volume. No? So it's, it would not be externalized at all. Hmm? OK, so to conclude, uh, environment is really something where you have different opinions. It can be namespace as a service. It can be a cluster. It can be even a set of clusters. And this is, as I have mentioned before, reflecting what I see with the customers. They are really different, uh, different demands. And um, as a tendency, uh, customers have still the big clusters. But for the new clusters, they will, they will go with smaller clusters, as I have showed, like hypershift, like single node open shift cluster. Hmm? Combining it with clusters as a service has become easier, as I've explained. So an environment has various components, as we have discussed. We have the applications. We have the dependency management. We have the security measures, and certainly the secrets management. Hmm? Now, what we want to achieve and what should be the goal of environment as a service is certainly that you can scale. Hmm? This means it does not matter if you have many namespaces, many clusters, many teams. It should not cause you a lot of more effort. Hmm? And this is basically the, the key that you need to automate. Hmm? So customers are telling me, if I don't automate what, I have, what we have discussed before, then I really would, get, would get crazy as an administrator. Some customers tell me it's hand, I can handle it with approving all this manually. But um, if you really have a big organization, then you need to automate as much as possible. And if you are doing this, as I've mentioned, you need a strong governance. This means you need your policies in place for monitoring as much as possible what is going on on your clusters. So, and now, uh, at the, quite at the end, I wanted to ask you if you have an opinion about this. So, you know, backstage, and there was also yesterday um, a talk, as the new um, developer platform, for platform as a service, and we are looking at the moment, should we, as an open cluster management team, work more with backstage? Is this something what the customer are looking for? Sometimes, as I mentioned, I hear yes. 
sometimes I, I get some concerns. For example, yesterday somebody uh, told me that um, it does not offer good life cycle management. And um, yeah, but we are seeing here a lot of uh, potential. So for example, regarding cluster life cycle management, if you see, for example, these tools like Hive, like uh, ACM, there is quite some complexity. No? So you need to have, deal with com retentions. You need to know, know many things in order to successfully install a, um, a cluster. So Backstage could help a lot with reducing this complexity for us. No? Um, yeah, we would like to know how good it is really for onboarding. So it has a very nice UI with many features, a very nice search function. So could we use this for enrolling users in a GitOps style? Then, one important topic I mentioned, but um, monitoring is very important when you want to provide self-service, when you, when you want, want to give freedom to your developers. So can we use Backstage for implementing nice observability plugins, which are helping us to, sh to see what is going on? And last but not least, uh, ensuring governance. Now, so governance means, for example, that you are controlling, that you are not exceeding the clusters, no? but you have something like right sizing in place where you're controlling that the namespaces are configured correctly. No? So question to the audience, do you have any uh, um, feedback here regarding backstage? Anybody, any comments? Okay, yeah. Then you at least know that this is something we are investigating. So basically, we have, I would say, two major um, uh, topics, what we need to investigate. We have the topic in secrets management, where customers are looking for some unification, no? that they have a common solution and not too many different ways to achieve it. And the second thing is to check if backstage is really something which larger organizations could use in order to provision to achieve environment as a service with, with, with different technologies what we have discussed before. Hmm? So, um, yeah, that's basically it. I, I will update the slides uh, with the links which um, I mentioned at the beginning regarding the blogs from Raffaele. Um, Raffaele, he also mentioned, uh, for example, that you need some external resources um, and for example, if you want to uh, configure databases in a GitOps style, for this he is recommending Crossplane. But this is something I, do, I did not like to discuss today because I've personally never seen it before. Uh, so uh, I'm just talk to you about what the customers are really discussing with me. So thank you. In an ideal world, um, um, the developer will only work with Git. So he needs, to, he needs to work declaratively as well. So he will get some resources which he can modify, which he will, after the modification, he will send the PR, and when it will be approved and applied to the environment. So um, with Backstage, you could certainly also hide this complexity here, in my opinion, that you make it maybe some, some UI around updating Git. I, but I have not seen this before. Huh? Yeah. I mean, another thing what we are maybe getting asked sometimes is about API. No? Um, they would like to not use Git, but they would like to directly use the API, especially if you have many different systems. But the talk was about Git today. <laughs> so this is why I believe you need to use it. Flux, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, it, it, I mean, it's not what Red Hat is, is doing, but uh, we have uh, many, we know that Flux has some very good features. So we are well aware.
Yep. That's something great. We, can, we were able to trace down who is responsible so the customer doesn't make the mistake. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you will. I have, I have a good story, I hope. So we really had this, this year an uh, escalation with a customer who was basically deploying, um, deleting an application set in production. No? So let's assume you, are, you have an application set and you, it's maybe app of app, you know what, what this means, you know it's a root application set and you are deleting this because you believe I can restore this quite easily or it's not a big problem no? or the resources on the cluster will not be um, deleted. In this case, uh, it was causing a big uh, problems for the customer and to be honest, two customers this year. And um, yeah, you, it, it does not matter uh, if it's Git or not, but you need to have some, some good security controls, in my opinion, to prevent such situations. And the best way, at least according to my experience, is what I have showed you before, is with admission controllers, where you really say, if, if a resource is very, very important, have a rule for the admission controller, block the deletion, unless you have some certain condition. So I have really, uh, we have implemented that customers who are even cluster administrator are not allowed to, for example, delete such an um, application set. Hmm? Thank you.